but people always trickle down around like 11. Yeah. Okay, great. We are live on YouTube. On YouTube. Who, Rob, I don't, the, the, I'm not sure which picture you're referring to, Rob. <laughs> I'm not sure either. Oh, his. It's, it's this one right there. It's a picture of, uh, who is that? I don't know. I've forgotten. I have to, I'd have to look at the caption. I think it's, it's you, Rob Insall and Laura Macheski, actually. <laughs> oh, my God. How did he spot it? Yeah, but you're so tiny on my screen. <laughs> Are you in your office or? Yeah, yep. Yeah, there's a giant is, active network behind me too. Oh, oh yeah. Is it the same photo of um, Rob and Laura that uh, it showed up on Twitter a few days ago um, or maybe a week ago of them very young sitting at a picnic table. It was really nice. Oh, no, no. This one's in, when they were visiting San Francisco. Uh, I think that's in the Marin Headlands. I think. Well, I can't see any of the details behind you, but I'll have to trust you. It's mm. there. All right. So we'll just give people about one to two more minutes, minutes to, yeah. to show up. I think people are also getting into the holiday mood. I really think that we should just collectively not do any work between Thanksgiving and New Year's. <laughs> Stop. <You know? laughs> not that much gets done anyway. So if we That's could just true. be honest with ourselves and just like... I mean, like, nothing uh, gets done around ASCB anyway for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Yeah. Is that, was that happening? That's happening soonish, right? I don't, I don't go to that one. Oh uh, yeah, it's from 1st to 10th. That's tough timing, I think. Because yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I'm just so, I just get so checked out at this point and like, I just need a break so badly. And, you know, I try, right? I keep, I have a million things on the calendar and have to keep doing it and all the deadlines, but. Well, okay, we at 11? Yeah, no work time. Okay, we can, I don't know, give people like, 30 seconds <laughs> it's up to you you're in charge it's fine I, I will start now I think they will okay okay hello everyone it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Dyke Mullins for our seminar today Dyke obtained his PhD in biomedical engineering from University of Kentucky and then his postdoc with Dr. Thomas Pollard at Johns Hopkins University and later at the Salk Institute for Biomedical Research in California Currently, he's a professor um, at University of California, San Francisco in the United States. His lab focuses on assembly and function of cytoskeletal networks. Also, apart from his science, Dyke also has a weakness for Oreo cookies, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I find you know, as equal fascinating as the <laughs> stuff you're gonna talk about. Uh, with this, I will give the virtual stage to Dyke, who is going to talk about branch active networks today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Dyke. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And I'm really shocked uh, that you know about my weakness for Oreo cookies. It makes me want to go online and see what other Tell you stalking <laughs> information there is. Um, all right. Um, so yes, as I say, it's a great pleasure uh, and privilege to be in this uh, meeting. This is, um, I sort of feel like maybe with this audience, um, some of the things that I have to go into much greater detail on with more general audiences, I can skip over a little bit. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but in classic fashion, I may have packed too much into this talk. So um, we'll see how far I get. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, branched action networks today. Uh, and uh, this is a neutrophil crawling through a collagen matrix. This neutrophil is uh, pushing out this very beautiful pseudopod to kind of force its way through uh, holes that it finds in this collagen matrix. It's also squeezing its nucleus uh, in order to uh, kind of get through these tight constrictions. And what I've uh, been interested in for a very long time is this question of how 
uh, how a collection of molecules, a random collection of macromolecules, uh, works together to establish a common identity to become a living thing, uh, something that we would recognize as the kind of fundamental unit of life, a living cell. And uh, the cytoskeletal systems operate uh, or offer a unique um, opportunity to study that process of uh, macromolecular self-assembly and function. And uh, I'm going to talk today about a motor. Uh, it's a motor for moving membranes that uh, is highly conserved and is, I would say, probably the main motor that cells use for uh, generating pushing forces. Uh, here's another movie. This is a lattice light sheet movie of a neutrophil crawling around on a 2D surface. This neutrophil is putting out these beautiful lamellar pseudopods and you'll see one come up uh, right there in the, in the beginning. And all of these pseudopods, all of these beautiful kind of membrane protrusions are being pushed out uh, by forces generated by the assembly of actin networks. So the free energy of actin polymerization is actually converted into work uh, to, to move these membranes, to push them forward. And, and uh, a, one particular kind of actin network that is adapted to moving membranes uh, are branched actin networks. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today, how they function, how they function as a motor. And I'm really gonna focus on this notion of motor activity. And like, a, like any good motor, uh, a branched actin network can be adapted to lots of different processes. Now this, I've started with a, uh, some movies of cells crawling uh, in part because this is a cell migration seminar series and that's a beautiful process. But branched actin networks uh, move and shape membranes for lots of different cellular processes, uh, including um, lamellopodial protrusion, endocytosis, phagocytosis, movement of intracellular cargo, generation of certain types of, uh, of um, uh, tight cell adhesions. And the key, I mean, here's the four of the key components of branched actin networks that I'm gonna be talking about today. The first one is the ARP23 complex, and that is a nucleation factor that makes new actin filaments. And it does it uh, in a very peculiar way, that is it makes them off of the sides of pre-existing actin filaments. The second is a nucleation promoting factor. And you can think of, in some ways, a nucleation promoting factor as a, a cargo adapter for this motor. Uh, it's the factor that tells the motor, that tells the actin network where to assemble and which membrane to push on. Uh, and these nucleation promoting factors, one of the key points of my talk today will be that the nucleation promoting factors are really the drivers of this process. They're really the master regulators of branched actin network assembly. They're much more interesting than I ever gave them credit for uh, in the beginning. Uh, the next factor is capping protein. And I'll say a little bit about why capping protein is so interesting and uh, is an absolutely essential part of this motor. Uh, and then actin. Uh, the thing I did not put on this slide is profilin. We'll, we'll talk a bit about profilin as well, which is an actin monomer binding protein. But these, um, these four proteins plus profilin uh, self-assemble to generate these space filling uh, networks that, that push, um, push membranes around. Now I said that nucleation promoting factors are, are key to this and I kind of described them as um, cargo adapters. There are lots of different nucleation promoting factors. There are several in, in mammals. There are, uh, there's wave, there's several isoforms of wave. Wave is involved in making pseudopods, involved in cell fusion, um, in uh, pushing cells together to uh, bring them into close opposition so they can fuse, uh, in forming adherence junctions and in uh, forming the cell cortex, the actin network of the cell cortex. WASP uh, is also involved in pseudopod protrusion. Interestingly, WASP and wave collaborate to make uh, lamellopodia. Uh, and it's also involved in cell fusion and in some mysterious ways involved in repairing double-strand DNA breaks in the nucleus. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, in WASP, which is distinct from WASP, is involved in making potosomes, uh, tight cell adhesions, uh, endosome recycling, uh, moving motile vesicles. WASH uh, is a nucleation promoting factor that uh, helps drive endocytosis, uh, endosome recycling, lysosome fusion, uh, retrieval of... of um, as Rob Insall showed, retrieval of some uh, components from uh, endosomes. And WAM uh, and JAMI are probably the least well understood, but they are certainly involved in making uh, autophagosomes and shaping autophagosomal membranes. So uh, these different nucleation promoting factors uh, target this network, these networks to different uh, cellular compartments. And they're highly conserved. I want to make the argument that this motor is conserved across eukaryotic phyla. So here are WASP and WAVE. The three that are conserved uh, across eukaryotic phyla are WASP, WAVE, and WASH. I'm just showing WASP and WAVE here. Their distribution across eukaryotic phyla uh, strongly suggests that they were present in the last uh, eukaryotic common ancestor. Uh, this is from a paper from Lil Fritz Leyland when she was in the lab. Uh, 
Uh, and the combination of WASP and WAVE correlates strongly with the ability to make um, pseudopods and to do kind of fast uh, cell migration. Uh, so at the top here is an example from uh, mammals. This is a famous movie of a crawling neutrophil. In the middle, this is a uh, chytrid fungus, which uh, Lil was able to show actually has a phase in, under, in which it can undergo uh, amoeboid motility, which is ARP2-3 dependent. Uh, and then near the bottom is Negleria gruberi, which is a, uh, an amoeba flagellate, which also uh, you'll see is making a fair number of blebs, but is also building these uh, ARP2-3 dependent um, pseudopods, and which it uses for motility. Uh, so all the components of this motor are conserved across, right across eukaryotic phyla. So it's a very ancient motor. And I, as I keep saying motor, let's, let's uh, think about what we mean when we say that something is a motor and, and say what we mean when we understand the mechanism by which this motor works. So uh, motors that we're more commonly used to thinking about are myosins and kinesins that move along actin filaments and microtubules. And to say that I understand the mechanism of myosin activity or kinesin activity usually means that I understand how the, um, the free energy of ATP hydrolysis is converted into some conformational change uh, that can generate force and move along uh, a filament, move along a track. Now, what do I mean to when I say I understand the mechanism of, of uh, motility or the, the mechanism of a motor that is a space-filling, uh, self-assembling motor, uh, like a branched actin network. What I mean by that is I, is I would like to understand how the, uh, the components of the system interact in time, how their interaction is coordinated to generate, uh, to generate force, to generate a polarized force, and, uh, and how that um, system, how the interaction of these molecules uh, depends on force, how it reacts to applied force. So we can study this process in vitro. At the bottom, I'm showing a gel. We've purified uh, the major components, ARP2-3 complex, a, nu a nucleation promoting factor called ACTA, uh, actin, capping protein, and, and cofilin and profilin. I'm not going to talk about cofilin today. Uh, we can reconstitute this process. We can take a nucleation promoting factor, which I've kind of shown here in yellow, and coat a uh, polystyrene microsphere here. Uh, and add the other components, and this polystyrene uh, microsphere will generate an actin network that then breaks symmetry and uh, pushes this particle around, and we'll push it around for hours. And we've used this to study lots of different processes, including the early events of uh, symmetry breaking, kind of the mechanical uh, rupture that uh, occurs at early phases of this process. And more recently, we can uh, use uh, micro patterning. We can pattern nucleation promoting factors on glass surfaces and grow actin networks off cover slips. Then we can use atomic force microscope cantilevers to uh, measure the growth of these networks and to apply forces and measure mechanical properties. Uh, from the other side, we can put on, put a uh, turf microscope objective on the other side of this cover slip, and we can literally count every single molecule that uh, enters the network. And uh, here are some pictures of this type of network. At the top, there's an AFM cantilever sitting over one of these micro patterned uh, spots. In the middle uh, is a kind of a side view of a wave one generated actin network that's built from um, confocal stacks and the, the bottom is a kind of a three quarter view of that same uh, type of network. All right, so how do uh, these networks generate force? Well, the best uh, picture for this comes from Alex McGilder and George Oster. It's called the elastic Brownian ratchet model. And that uh, holds that actin filaments uh, undergo thermal motion. And when they're up against a load and cannot intercalate a monomer, uh, you can, they just can't grow. But the filaments can fluctuate. And if they fluctuate away from this load far enough so that they can incorporate a monomer or a collection of monomers, when they return to their equilibrium position, they uh, now generate a force on that load. So this is called an elastic Brownian ratchet. Uh, elastic because the elasticity of the filaments is important. Their ability to, to, to flex and to fluctuate uh, under uh, thermal motion. Uh, Brownian because, uh, as I say, because it requires the Brownian motion, the, the collision with water molecules, and um, ratchet because the polymerization acts like a ratchet. So once the filament gets longer, it, it, it uh, doesn't generally doesn't decrease in length, and that uh, increase in length actually uh, can push the network forward. The polymerization is rectifying the thermal motion in some way. So that's the basics, the basic idea um, for and. Uh, Later on, if I have 
assuming I have time, I can show you some uh, direct evidence that we have for this model. All right. Now, um, so the for a building a lamellopodiolactin network, uh, the first thing that happens is there's a lot of signaling involved. Uh, and once all the signaling cascades have uh, resulted in the polarization of the uh, signaling molecules, um, which is a fascinating process in itself that I'm not gonna talk too much about, uh, it ends up with uh, small G proteins being localized, uh, in particular RAC and ARF, which we found uh, together can stimulate the wave complex. Um, they localize the wave complex to the membrane. And the main thing that happens upon activation is that a C-terminal region of the wave protein is released from an autoinhibitory interaction with the rest of the complex. Uh, this is a natively unstructured region, and it has uh, binding sites for three proteins, uh, a binding site for the ARP2-3 complex, uh, one or more binding sites for actin called a WH2 domain, and multiple binding sites for profilin. And that's basically it. It seems very um, underwhelming. But let's go through the process in a little bit of detail because this will be uh, in a little bit of schematic detail uh, because this will be important um, for what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So nucleation promoting factors, they bind actin via this WH2 domain. They bind to the ARP2-3 complex via an acidic domain. There are two binding sites uh, on the ARP2-3 complex for these regions. They're often called VCA regions. And um, these two nucleation promoting factors are required to fully activate <clears throat> an ARP2-3 complex. If the ARP2-3 complex is bound to the side of a filament, then these uh, there's a conformational change and these uh, actin monomers are uh, presented in some way to the ARP2-3 complex to form a, a nucleus. So this is, these actin monomers are absolutely required for, uh, for WASP family NPF mediated actin nucleation. And so once this nucleus is formed, it can elongate and it will elongate until for a relatively short time until it is capped by capping protein. So that's the process. I'm not uh, gonna worry about the high resolution details of this just yet. Now, if we understand the, the mechanism of how this uh, motor works, then uh, we should be able to answer the following very four very simple questions. How does actin enter a branched network? What mechanism sets the density of the network? How does it respond to force? And what are the mechanics of these networks? So I'm gonna try and uh, answer these questions uh, in sequence here. And how does actin enter a branched network? This is one I uh, had not really thought of as being particularly interesting for a very long time. If you, the first place to look is, uh, we can look in the textbooks. If you look in Bruce Albert's textbook, um, what you will see is a branched actin network floating in space for some reason um, with no membrane around. Uh, but you see that the actin monomers uh, are shown to kind of diffuse out to the leading edge and then soluble actin uh, binds to uh, free barbed ends. There's no clear picture in this why this network would be polarized, why the barbed ends would be pointing in one direction. Um, but the clear implication here is that you have soluble actin binding to free barbed ends. Uh, if you look in Tom Pollard's textbook, you see the same thing. Again, this kind of floating network um, binding to uh, diffusing uh, actin, in this case, profilin actin complexes. And in this old uh, illustration from a review that Tom and Laurent Blachois and I wrote many years ago, at least there's a membrane here, which gives you some indication for why the network would be polarized. Um, but again, the actin, profilin actin complexes uh, are shown to kind of diffuse out to the leading edge and to bind to uh, free barbed dense. So that right. uh, arrow was never supposed to mean anything about directed transport? No, but thank, thank you for that question. Uh, no, it was not. It was just meant to, to be a, uh, but then I saw Graham, some of Graham Dunn's uh, stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, so there's there's obviously something uh, much more interesting going on there, I think. I thought it was, I always thought it was implied that there was something interesting. No, it, it, it probably should never have been there. <laughs> it was actually meant to show kind of a, a cycle, like the Krebs cycle or something, show that this is a biochemical cycle uh, where the components uh, that are disassembled and can return back to the site of assembly. So that was, that was the whole idea. Um, so here is a, an experiment that gets at how actin enters a branched actin network. We did it for many, many years before we knew we'd actually even done it. 
uh, at the top, we have a single actin filament. Uh, in the middle, we have an actin network that's pushing around a spherical particle that's coated with a nucleation promoting factor. So this is uh, this network is being generated by continual rounds of actin nucleation and filament growth. And on the bottom, we have an actin network, a similar actin network, branched actin network growing against a, a cover slip. Now, uh, each of these actin filaments uh, can grow at what Tom Pollard has shown as a diffusion limited rate. 10 per micromolar per second is the rate constant for that. Well, a very well known number in the actin field. And so uh, these networks, that should be the absolute speed limit for these networks. They can't grow faster than an actin filament can grow, right? Um, so we, uh, we can measure the growth of a single actin filament. That's a turf microscopy experiment on the top with a, uh, an, a seed, a green actin seed uh, that is growing a kind of blue actin filament off of it. And then in the middle, we have uh, an actin network pushing around a uh, polystyrene microsphere. The, net, the reaction was started using green labeled actin and then diluted into blue labeled actin. And so uh, all the new material there is blue, so we can actually measure the rate of elongation uh, accurately. And on the bottom, we have a network growing off of a cover slip and we can measure the rate of growth of that network using an AFM cantilever very accurately. Uh, so the thing, the problem is we had never put those three um, graphs on the right on the same axes, but when we did, we found uh, that it looked like this, that the slowest of those three was a single actin filament. Now, if an actin filament is growing at a diffusion limited rate, uh, and that's responsible for pushing these networks forward, the network should certainly grow slower because the filaments are not all oriented in the direction of motion, for one thing, uh, typically about 35 degrees off the direction of motion. Uh, and then the um, uh, they're growing by continual rounds of uh, elongation, nucleation, and capping. Uh, and there's a significant amount of tethering between the, the load uh, and the network. So all those things should dramatically slow this network down. And yet they grow much faster, several times faster than individual filaments can grow under the, exactly the same conditions. Uh, so what, what could cause this? We thought of several uh, uh, kind of physics-based explanations, but the simplest one uh, that we thought of is related to the fact that nucleation promoting factors can bind monomeric actin. So I, I mentioned that th this WH2 domain, which binds actin, it, uh, is required for nucleation. It binds that actin and gives it to the ARP23 complex. But we thought, well, what can it also give that actin to a nearby actin filament? And so to test that, Peter Beeling, postdoc in the lab, made these micro patterned uh, patches of wave. Uh, this is wave one on a, a cover slip surface. And he uh, added actin filaments and he had to do this uh, extra little trick of using uh, labeled eutrophin, which is a, an actin filament binding protein uh, to discriminate between the filaments and the monomers because these patches bind a lot of actin monomers as well. So in green, you see the actin filaments growing. And the thing to watch is when an actin filament leaves the patch, how fast it's growing. And then when it gets back on the patch, how fast it's growing. So can you see my uh, cursor here? So down at the bottom of this patch, notice this filament when it gets back onto the pattern, first notice how fast it's growing, boom, and it's like it hits the wall here. And this one gets back on the patch, boom, and takes off. So first off, most of the polymerization is confined to the patch, and it's much faster when it's on this patch than when it's off the patch. So uh, here are chymographs taken along, space-time plots taken along uh, individual actin filaments. And you see when it's on the, the pattern, it's growing at, you know, uh, five times faster than when it's off the pattern. Uh, this is density dependent, and the highest density we were able to get to is about 2,500 uh, molecules per square micron, which is about uh, tenfold lower than the density of nucleation promoting factors at the leading edge of a cell. Uh, so this is, as I say, it's, uh, the, this growth velocity increases linearly with the density of the nucleation promoting factors. It also is true for uh, all the ones that we have tested, WAVE and NWASP in particular. NWASP is even better. Uh, so. Uh, so where, how does this work? Where is this coming from? So the, the first thing we thought is it's the WH2 domain that's promoting this. So here is the domain organization of wave one. Um, it starts on the left-hand side with this um, SCAR homology domain that's involved in kind of docking it to the rest of the regulatory complex. Uh, and then there's a basic domain for binding lipids. And then the, the business end, the region that I said was natively unstructured and kind of released when the complex is activated, uh, is this proline-rich domain. And it has several stretches, polyproline stretches that can bind to profilin and to, and to SH3 domains. But profilin uh, is important for 
purposes of this talk. Then the WH2 domain can bind monomeric actin. There's a single WH2 domain. And then this central acidic domain can bind the ARP23 complex. So what um, Peter Beeling and Scott Hansen did was they took this uh, uh, proline-rich WH2 and CA domain, fused it to a fluorescent molecule, and then uh, either put it onto supported lipid bilayers or micropatterned it. And they looked at the ability of, uh, and then they uh, did some mutagenesis and looked at the ability of these constructs to support uh, motility. So first off, uh, on the bottom here, I'm showing chymographs of individual filaments growing across these patches. Uh, and the, the first column just shows dark cherry, dark M cherry patterned on the surface. And you see the growth rate here, which is just the normal kind of uh, growth rate we'd expect for an actin filament. Then if we have the entire proline rich WH2 and CA domain, uh, that we see the uh, acceleration. If you get rid of the WH2 domain, uh, that uh, acceleration goes away. So that's uh, pretty good evidence that it's the WH2 that's required. And if you have just the WH2 domain, uh, you can see this uh, acceleration. So the WH2 domain appears to be, when you use actin as a substrate, uh, appears to be the major um, uh, polymerase, confer the major polymerase activity. But there's a little bit of an issue. So profilin is an actin monomer binding protein. It's present stoichiometric with the- uh, Can I ask a quick was, question? Does yeah, that please. work if, the, if, if it's in solution? Uh, or is no, only if it's not only at all if only only if it's clustered on the surface. In fact, it slows it slows things down if it's in solution. Yep, okay. yep. So it has to be spatially patterned and 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 clustered. That's a great question. All right. So here's the here's a little bit of a problem. Uh, Profilin is stoichiometric with the monomeric actin uh, in the in cells. We think that the vast majority of actin is present as profilin actin complexes. Um, so here's profilin, here's actin in my little schematic diagram, that's profilin actin. And um, an actin monomer by itself can bind to the end of a filament, and then it, it must undergo a conformational change. We know that the conformation of an actin um, protomer in a filament is slightly different from an actin monomer out in solution. We know that profilin binds to actin with very high affinity, 20 nanomolar affinity, right? And so this causes a little bit of a problem because profilin sits right at the spot where the next actin monomer should bind in this filament, sits the barbed in. Uh, so how do you get profilin out of the way? Uh, well, there's this uh, slight magic trick that happens that Tom Pollard and um, John Cooper discovered back in 1984. Uh, and that is that profilin maintains high affinity for actin at the end of a, of a of a filament, the barbed end of a filament. But once that actin undergoes this conformational change, the affinity drops by several hundred fold and the profilin gets kicked off. In fact, it gets kicked off so fast that it doesn't really interfere with filament elongation. Right. That's a key point that, that uh, is often kind of missed. All right, now what happens when we have profilin actin here? So uh, this is just using now profilin actin as a substrate. And we see that, uh, again, dark cherry is the, um, the control, it shows the rate at which the actin filaments are growing uh, by themselves. If we have just the WH2 domain, not only do we not get acceleration, it slows down dramatically. And that's in part because WH2 domains uh, in the presence of profilin uh, can cap uh, actin filaments. Uh, Marie-France Carlier showed that a while back and, and uh, I have some ideas about that if people wanna ask me about it later. Um, now, if we add the proline rich domain and the WH2 domain, boom, we get this dramatic uh, polymerase activity. Uh, if we mutate the proline rich domain so that it can't bind to profilin, again, we're back to this um, really um, super slow uh, elongation. And if we have the, the proline rich domain by itself, uh, again, we see the acceleration. Now, on the right hand here, you see uh, kind of bar graphs of this. And the key thing to note here is that the Profilin, the proline-rich region plus the WH2 domain is actually better than the proline-rich region by itself. So the two of them, when actin is bound to profilin, the two of them uh, can collaborate to accelerate the growth of actin filaments locally. And the fact that it can grow faster than, um, than just the WH, sorry, just the proline-rich region alone suggests that somehow the WH2 can be converted from something that's a hindrance to something that's uh, a help uh, in the presence of this uh, proline rich region. And that um, strongly suggests that, that the proline rich region can transfer uh, actin from profilin actin complex onto the WH2 domain, uh, kind of as shown in this movie, I think. Uh, 
uh, this <laughs> movie shows in a very deliberate way, which is not what it would look like uh, in reality, but just shows that uh, the idea that a, um, a profilin or an actin can be transferred from this from a profilin actin complex onto the WH2 domain. And I don't want to get uh, bogged down in uh, this experiment, uh, but I well I will. Uh, briefly tell you that this is an experiment that shows that that's the case, that the WH2 domain can be loaded with actin from the proline-rich region. Uh, and this is based on a FRET uh, assay that Peter Beeling came up with in the lab when he was in the lab. He added a, um, a FRET uh, donor to the uh, adjacent to the WH2 domain and then a uh, quencher to actin. So when the actin is mounted to the WH2 domain, it quenched the fluorescence uh, of the uh, fluorophore nearby, but not when it was bound to the proline rich region. And then he asked the question of uh, what happens when you look at competition between actin uh, and profilin. So on the left-hand side here, you have uh, actin binding to these different uh, constructs uh, as measured by FRET. And you can see when it binds, if, if there's no WH2 domain, you see no binding. That's here at the bottom. Uh, if you have just the WH2 domain, you get you can get binding. If you have the proline rich and the WH2 domain, you get actually even higher affinity binding. That's probably because this helix is a bit more stable when there's more flanking sequence uh, next by uh, nearby. Now, what happens if you try to compete actin off of the WH2 domains with profilin? If you don't have the proline rich region, you can compete all the actin off. If you do have, uh, if you have a proline rich region that actually, um, and this is two, two cases, if it's just lacking the proline rich region, you can compete it off. If you have a proline rich region that is, uh, um, has point mutants that prevent it from binding profilin, you can compete all of the, uh, all of the actin off of profilin. But if, the, if you have an intact proline rich region, you cannot compete all of the actin off. Uh, which means that you can, um, even at very high super stoichiometric amounts of profilin, uh, you're able to load actin onto this WH2 domain. So uh, actin can be transferred from the proline rich region onto the, the WH2 domain. So profilin actin is a substrate for uh, these nucleation promoting factors. All right. And this just shows the way this works on a membrane. Uh, you have uh, profilin actin binding to the proline rich region here uh, on the uh, nucleation promoting factor then that interacting with the barbed end of an actin filament and this conformational change that causes the profilin to pop off. Now, the next bit uh, is interesting and less is known about that. That is the profilin being kicked off of this proline rich region. Um, Roberto Dominguez has some interesting data uh, on what happens with VASP and profilin uh, in the presence of actin. All right, so um, I think this movie just illustrates this uh, polymerase activity that I was showing. You have um, profilin actin binding to these proline rich regions, and then um, uh, accelerating the growth of uh, nearby actin films. And the, again, this looks much more deliberate than the process actually would look in reality. But it's just to illustrate, illustrate the point. All right, so uh, our first question answered How does actin enter a branched network? It does not come from solution, uh, it comes from the surface. So the surface uh, collects a pool of monomeric actin. If you do just a back in the envelope calculation, for uh, based on the acceleration of the actin uh, in these networks compared to uh, nearby actin filaments, more than 90% of the actin enters from the surface. So uh, it does not come from solution. So this is a surface bound pool and there are lots of really interesting kind of implications of having the actin being loaded into this pool and coming from the pool uh, into the network. So I, I see Claire has unmuted herself. Yeah. Um. Do you think that the, that the fact that the membrane goes all, you know, everyone always talks about the leading edge and you draw it yep. there like it's across, yep. there's like it's one dimensional yep. or two dimensional, but um, do you think that the membrane above and below that and is important for it? And that's why it has to stay flat? I don't know. Like why I'll, a lamella pod yeah. stays yeah. planar? I don't know. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. So when we looked at, uh, at lamellopodial protrusions coming out of uh, HL60 cells, the earliest, the very earliest thing you see is a line across the surface of the cell before it even kind of protrudes out, before you even get this kind of sandwich. So I think that there's something that- Forming that, a line. That yeah. leads to this linear 
assembly of these signaling, either the signaling molecules, or, yeah, because there's nothing in the network itself that wants to be a, a flat sheet, as far as I can tell. So what about, I mean, is there a difference in the, here's a good question. If, uh, you know, all, everything you're showing, I'll be the judge of that. you're on a, you've got it on a two, two D, um, uh, surface, but when you put it on a line, if you put it on like a, a yeah. glass rod or something, yeah. it, does it go the same speed? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Jeff Kuhn did a lot of beautiful experiments, uh, with glass fibers and I don't, that's a great question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. That's a really good, that is okay. That is a good question. <laughs> All right. Any other questions at this point? So there's question one. So question two, what's mechanism sets network density? Well, this one, um, is, uh, very easy. It's a corollary of the, of what we just talked about. Um, so we, Mary France Carly was the first person, I think, to describe branched actin assembly as autocatalytic. It is autocatalytic in the sense that um, actin filaments catalyze the formation of new actin filaments. Uh, you branch off of, so you have one filament in the beginning here, you form a branch, and I have two filaments, you can form two branches, now you can form four branches, and it kind of grows, uh, these networks grow geometrically, and we can see them grow uh, explosively. Here's a, an actin, here's some actin networks growing on uh, patches of wave and you can see the wave is in magenta and the actin I think is in green. So you see white uh, when the two of them um, are overlapping. And the, the thing to notice is there's no actin network at the beginning. And then you see two spots on this left hand one going from here and from here. This is a single actin filament that has touched this surface and kicked off this reaction that spreads across the surface like wildfire. Another filament, uh, kind of kicked off the process down here. Uh, and again, here you see it spreading from a couple of sites. So there's explosive growth of, of these networks. Um, so what sets the density? Why don't they just continue to get uh, denser and denser until they form a black hole? Um, I always assumed that it would just be the packing density of actin, but that would mean that all branched actin networks have the same density. They pack until the physical limit of, of packing, but that's not true. We know that, that the densities of these networks can be set kinetically by changing things like the capping protein concentration. So what sets it? Well, let's look at this. So um, this diagram just shows the flow of actin uh, through these nucleation promoting factors. And now uh, I hope you'll appreciate that they're not just nucleation promoting factors. They also promote, uh, they're also polymerases, potent polymerases. Um, and that probably explains also, I probably should have mentioned that wave, even though it's, um, is the primary thing we think of it doing is activating the ARP23 complex. It also shows up, uh, and in WASP, they show up in the tips of Philopodia, where there is no ARP23 complex at all. There are just other actin polymerases like BASP. So, um, so they are playing, in fact, they have almost exactly the same domain organization as BASP, uh, which is a, a actin polymerase. All right, so uh, actin can be loaded onto these uh, pro-enriched regions, transferred to the WH2, and then uh, onto an ARP23 complex to make a, a nucleus. But what if there are actin filaments close by? If there are actin, a significant number of actin filaments close by, that actin on the WH2 domain can go to the barbed end of a nearby actin filament instead of the ARP23 complex. In fact, that reaction is much faster than the nucleation reaction. There's a very slow first order conformational change that has to happen to make a nucleus, but um, the, uh, that is not the case for donating the actin to a nearby filament. So if you have uh, very few filaments, most of that actin on the WH2 domain is, goes toward nucleation. As the local density of actin filaments increases and begins to poach more and more of the actin off of the WH2 domain, the nucleation rate goes down. So this is a negative feedback uh, that controls it. And we can, you can see this by, um, as you change the capping rate, you directly change the uh, rate of nucleation. Uh, capping is actually determined by the rate Sorry, nucleation is determined by the rate of capping. All right. So uh, the answer to this question is, we know that on the right-hand side, we see that um, uh, nucleation is a um, autocatalytic process. Uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, autocatalytic process where filaments uh, catalyze the formation of new filaments. Um, and, but there is also a negative feedback arm of this. And that is when you get, the more filaments you get, the more you poach a, an essential element of this nucleation reaction. And that is uh, actin bound to WH2 domains. Uh, now it's interesting that, that this mechanism for activating the ARP23 complex, the WASP family 
version of this um, requires actin bound to a WH2 domain, meaning this autocatalytic mechanism requires actin be bound to the site, which is primarily functioning as a negative feedback regulator. There is another way to activate the ARP23 complex that Brad, no one has found that does not make branches and is not autocatalytic. The spin 90 dip one uh, molecules can activate ARP23 to make linear filaments that do not require a mother filament. No autocatalysis. And interestingly, no requirement for an actin monomer bound to a WH2 domain. So if you don't have the positive feedback, you don't need the negative feedback. All right, so now how does a branched actin network respond to force? Uh, now, the, the way that um, motor proteins have uh, traditionally been studied uh, and the mechanism of force generation and the response to force is by purifying the molecules and then putting them in some jig that enables you to simultaneously um, apply forces and measure distances. Uh, kind of measure uh, the power stroke, for example. Um, or if uh, in the old days, uh, a jig where you take uh, skinned rabbit muscle and apply forces and measure the, the step changes in length of these rabbit muscles. So some jig for simultaneously measuring and applying force uh, and measuring length. So this is what, uh, in collaboration with Dan Fletcher's lab, um, uh, Dan and I shared a, a postdoc, Peter Beeling, uh, there's another talented postdoc, Tade Lee, who's an AFM expert, and they built this beautiful system for uh, growing branched actin networks uh, under an AFM cantilever uh, and applying loads and, again, counting all the molecules that go in. So we can measure, the, measure and apply forces, uh, measure distance, and now literally count every molecule uh, going into the network. So we can ask the question of how these networks respond to load. And what uh, Peter and Tade found that we published back in 2016 is that as you apply force to these networks, they become denser. Um, so there's an increase in network density. And then uh, next year, in a beautiful paper, Michael Six lab showed that this uh, happens uh, in vivo. They, were, they did this using fish keratocytes and by uh, applying transient loads to the leading edge by pulling membrane tethers and increasing the mem membrane tension. And they could see this uh, wave of increased density that, that is born at the leading edge when you when the membrane tension goes up and then kind of treadmills back and uh, beautiful work. So what causes this change in density? There are two possibilities. Uh, one is that there's just a change, a reorganization of the architecture of the network. So that the filaments pack, same number of filaments, but they just pack more densely. Uh, and another way of saying this is the angle of attack of the filaments uh, to the membrane goes down. So you can pack more filaments into a, a smaller space, pack the same number of filaments into a smaller space. The other is that the number of filaments actually goes up, all right? And so Peter, what he did was he counted the number of free barbed ends to see if that could account for the change in density. And to do this, he grew uh, actin networks and then he froze them by uh, flowing in uh, phalloidin and latrunculin, uh, a drug that will freeze the block depolymerization and another one that will block, and debranching, and another one that will block polymerization. And at the same time, he flowed in a, uh, a fluorescently labeled capping protein. So when you flow in the fluorescently labeled capping protein in this kind of frozen network, it will cap all the filaments that at the time when you arrested the reaction uh, were uncapped. So you can measure the number of growing actin filaments. And he did that uh, under load. And you can see that the uh, number of growing actin filaments, I hope you can see under the control network is the top, loaded network is down below. Um, and uh, the, there are multiple kinetic phases to this binding, um, but the first one represents binding to uh, uncapped uh, barbed ends. And uh, that increases with load, right? So it increases, and we can do that both by bulk fluorescence measurements using turf, uh, or by counting individual capping proteins using 3D Storm. And I'll uh, get the same answer both ways, that, that you get a, about a threefold increase uh, in the number of barbed ends uh, over this range of forces, which goes from almost zero force to uh, stall force. Unfortunately, that only accounts for uh, about a third of the change in the density. So there's a threefold change in the number of free barbed ends. There's a tenfold change uh, in density. So we argue that the other threefold change uh, is due to changes in the architecture of the network, changes in the uh, angle of attack. And this is consistent with um, 
some modeling work done by Wachtell and Schwartz, which uh, shows that there are two stable configurations of the network. One where uh, the, the branch angle is 70 degrees. The, the, the angle between the mother and daughter filaments is 70 degrees. And they're, so they're two stable um, self-replicating configurations of the network. One where the angles are equal. And so uh, the, um, this one generates a, a angle or a filament that has an angle of attack of about 50 degrees to the membrane. And then this one does too. So, so each mother filament generates a daughter filament that has the same angle of attack as it does to the membrane. And the other one is this one. Uh, I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm doing, you know, the village people dance from the 1970s. Um, this one where you have uh, 90 degrees and 70 degrees. So this 90 degree filament will generate a 70 degree filament, and the 70 will generate a 90. Now there, and the interesting thing is that there is a uh, change uh, in organization of the network from the left-hand configuration, the 55-55 to the 90-70 you know, uh, under high load. And the reason for that is that this 20 degree, this filament has a 20 degree angle of attack. It's, if you think about its connection to the membrane, many more uh, fluctuations will allow a monomer to intercalate. So it's harder to stall this filament, this 20 degree filament. The 90 degree filament stalls very quickly, but this one can continue to push. So under high load, you, uh, you see those uh, 20 degree filaments. And this is also what, um, what the six lab saw when they did uh, electron microscopy of, the, of their cells. That however still, so that only accounts for about half of it. So there's, there's a threefold change due to architecture and there's a threefold change due to the number of barbed ends. So what causes the change in the number of free barbed ends? Well, uh, at steady state, the rate of capping has to equal the rate of nucleation. And capping is just a bimolecular reaction. So the number of free bar, uh, density of free barbed ends times the capping protein concentration times a rate constant, that's the rate of capping. Uh, and that has to equal the overall rate of nucleation. So we can rearrange that equation. And we see that the filament density is just given by their overall rate of nucleation divided by how fast individual filaments are capped, right? So there's only two ways to increase the number of free barbed ends. We can increase the overall rate of nucleation, right? Or we can decrease the rate at which individual filaments are capped. And this is, uh, there's some suggestion from the literature that this uh, might happen. There are uh, papers from Anders Carlson that suggest that when you push on the network, you're pushing these nucleation promoting factors in contact with the actin filaments and that should increase the rate of nucleation. And that was our preconceived notion. All right, but we can measure all these things. So we measured that the term on the top, we measured the overall rate of nucleation and it does not go up. In fact, it goes down. Um, so the, uh, and it goes down linearly with force. So this, uh, and so that means it has to be the capping rate. That's, that's, uh, that's different. And when we uh, measure the single filament capping rate, we see that it falls dramatically. So that the ratio of nucleation to capping, as I said, uh, it shows this beautiful kind of threefold increase. Now, what causes the, uh, this decrease in the capping rate? Uh, the, the decrease in nucleation, I didn't put any slides in here to discuss this, but the decrease in nucleation has to do with an effect we call barbed end interference. And that is the fact that WH2 domains uh, will, will stick to barbed ends. I mentioned earlier that in the presence of profilin, they will cap barbed ends. If you push them into contact with the network, they will tie, barbed ends will tie up the WH2 domains uh, and decrease the rate of nucleation. And, and Peter did a beautiful, another FRED experiment showed that that's what's happening in this case. This is called barbed end interference. All right, so why does the, why does the capping rate go down? Well, it, uh, it would seem like the, the rate constant for capping might be force dependent. Why would that be? Well, I uh, said earlier that the best explanation for how force is generated is this elastic Brownian ratchet model. That is, you have individual filaments that are fluctuating and when they fluctuate away from the load, you can add a monomer. Now, uh, we and everybody else who thought about this probably should have thought about capping protein as well, because capping protein has to do the same thing that an actin monomer does. It has to intercalate between the load and the end of the filament. So it should be subject to the same constraints, the same, should obey the same Brownian ratchet, meaning that as you apply force, the, diff the, the uh, difficulty of capping that filament should go up and it should go up exponentially. 
Um, now, if you look at the atomic structure of an actin filament with a capping uh, protein bound to the end of it, um, it uh, the capping protein has this uh, folded globular domain that's not involved in the actual capping reaction uh, that adds exactly the same length increment to the end of the filament as an actin monomer. And again, this is true across eukaryotic species. Um, so it appears to be tuned to, uh, to have the same force response. We can uh, change this force response by uh, making a bulkier capping protein. And uh, what Peter <clears throat> did was he uh, used GST. So capping protein is a heterodimer, GST is a homodimer. So he made this homo heterodimer uh, where GST is uh, kind of uh, extending the capping protein and almost doubling its size. And then asked, does that have any uh, effect on the force response? Ah, and I did I not put that data in here? Um, Hang on a second while I try and pull that up. Must be in here somewhere. Uh, I might have taken it out for time earlier. Oh, yeah, Dyke, sorry, just to also tell you we're reaching. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'm, uh, this is almost, this is a good stopping point. Um, so the, um, what you will see here is that as you increase the force, so this, um, the left-hand uh, pattern here is under load, and we have on the top regular capping protein, on the bottom, um, uh, this uh, bulky capping protein. And as you increase the load, you see that the ratio between the two, this is in the same experiment, <clears throat> uh, changes dramatically. So this, the, the wild-type capping protein keeps pace with the actin, actually. Uh, as it appears to be tuned to do, but the um, bulky capping protein gets flushed out of the system. So this is the first, uh, as far as I'm aware, the first uh, direct evidence for the uh, elastic Brownian ratchet, direct evidence. Um, and so the answer, let's scoot up here. The answer to the third question uh, is that, <clears throat> how does the branched action network respond to load forces? Uh, it increases the number of actin filaments because the balance between nucleation, overall nucleation, and the rate constant for filament capping uh, is changed by force. So as you apply force, the rate of nucleation goes down, but it does not go down by a lot. But the rates of filament elongation and capping fall off exponentially uh, so that the length distribution actually stays the same. Um, but the uh, uh, ratio between nucleation and capping changes and uh, and so this is the kind of uh, force feedback mechanism that uh, maintains the uh, or actually increases the number of uh, free barb dens. So the uh, it is a uh, Brownian ratchet mechanism that um, tuned Brownian ratchets, I would say, that give you this uh, force response. All right, so anyway, I got three out of four questions, not too bad. Um, and um, so here's a brief summary. Um, so how does actin enter a branched actin network? It enters from the surface. It, uh, actin is collected by these active surfaces from solution and delivered directly to uh, the network. Uh, what's the mechanism setting the density of the network? Well, that's a, uh, a negative feedback that is introduced by the WH2 domain. In fact, I would say that's the main reason you have a WH2 domain, actin monomer binding. Uh, region that's required for nucleation is to introduce this negative feedback to uh, so you can set the density of the network. How does the network respond to load? Uh, it responds by increasing its density in part by changing its architecture and in part by uh, using this kind of uh, uh, matched Brownian ratchet mechanism to actually increase the uh, number of free barb dens. And then what's the, what are the mechanics? Well, the mechanics kind of violate uh, uh, what we think should happen based on um, random uh, actin networks. So I'll end there. Uh, the animations uh, that I showed you, the beautiful animations were done by a former student in the lab, Janet Awasa, who's now a professor at University of Utah and a molecular animator. Um, a lot of the biochemistry was done by Scott Hansen, who's now a um, associate professor at uh, University of Oregon. And the um, uh, lattice light sheet microscopy was done by Lillian Fritz Leyland, who's now at the uh, Professor at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And the, uh, the bulk of what I showed you uh, 
uh, in terms of the force response and uh, was done by Peter Beeling, who's a joint postdoc uh, with me and Dan Fletcher, and who's now an investigator at the Max Planck Institute. And again, this was done in collaboration with the greatest collaborator I've ever worked with, uh, Dan Fletcher, who I, whose praises I will sing if, if, uh, if you want me to. All right. So. Great, fantastic. I just so wanted much. to say, um, Dan Fletcher is actually the reason that I got interested in cell migration. Um, right. I was an undergrad and he came and gave a talk and he showed a movie of cells moving around and I was, I was hooked. So <laughs> just to, um, just to echo that. So we have lots of questions coming in the chat. As always, if you want to raise your hand, drop questions in the chat, however we want to do it. Our first one from back in the beginning of your talk from Kinjal, um, mm -hmm. asking if the fluctuation of the membrane is also playing a role in the Brownian ratcheting. That's a really good question. And I, I think it's still a little, it's, it's a little bit unclear. I would say it probably, it, it certainly plays um, less of a role than was originally thought. The original idea for the Brownian ratchet is that the membrane is, is fluctuating and that the filaments are growing in uh, to rectify that thermal motion. But that was uh, really kind of done in by um, measure experiments using uh, pathogens being kind of pushed around back in networks. And, and small particles and vesicles, which show that the velocity of the network is independent of the size of the particles, so independent of the diffusion coefficient of what's being pushed around. And the, the membrane is tightly tethered to the network as well, because um, uh, I didn't talk too much about it, but if you grab a particle that's being pushed by a branch dash network, grab the particle and pull it, it will pull the network with it, it's tightly attached. And that attachment is mainly we think due to these WH2 domains binding to free barbed ends. And so, so I think that that's probably damping a lot of the fluctuations of the membrane to tell the truth. Wonderful. Next question is from uh, Jim Sellers. Uh, microtubules bend when they hit the membrane and why don't actin filaments do the same? They do, they're short. Uh, actin filaments are on the order of, and, and when, actin, when microtubules hit the membrane and bend, uh, I think Claire can probably answer this question better than me, but I think a lot of that has to do with the actin that's bending them uh, rather than the membrane. Um, and uh, yeah. so actin filaments will bend when they hit the membrane, but they're uh, on the order of 100 uh, uh, monomers long, so about you know, 300 nanometers on average. And they're, so that they're, they're pretty stiff uh, at that point, at that length. Okay, um, another one from Claire. She asks, what about the whole thing about flexed filaments being better for ARP23 binding? And that doesn't seem to fit with the decreased nucleation under load that you're seeing. Well, it, it might be even worse if it wasn't for that. So that's all I can say about that. We, we, we would, I mean, I, it's definitely true that, the, that this uh, kind of convex surface of a, of a kind of uh, bent actin filament is a better substrate for ARP23. Uh, and definitely biases the nucleation that way. Yep. Great. Um, another question from Tehum. Uh, any insight on how the distribution of ARF or RAC on the membrane is regulated? Oh, yes. Uh, th that's this whole branch of the literature on how, um, it, and it, so I, I showed it, what I showed was, a, you know, a, a kind of a lamella podial actin network being. Um, being kind of pushed out. And a lot of work has uh, gone on to, for example, in HL60 cells to connect the binding of an F of a FMLP to an FMLP receptor and all the downstream signaling events that lead to the localization of those uh, small G proteins. Um, the, it's all the other types of actin networks that are branched actin networks. I think that's it's less clear how some of those are created. For example, I'm really interested in how um, WAM and JAMI are actually localized. I think it's it's um, it's less clear how those are localized to their substrates. Great. From Anders Carlson, uh, is the lateral diffusion of actin monomers along the membrane important? And if so, how fast is that? That's a really good question, and um, and I don't know the answer. And I think there might be some mysterious things going on uh, based on I I don't think anybody has satisfactorily explained. Um, uh, Graham Dunn's observation that actin kind of moves to the it, through these uh, through the branched actin network out to the leading edge faster than you would expect and more vectorially than you would expect based on diffusion. Now the lateral spread, 
I, I, because the actin in that surface bound pool is bound to mobile molecules, um, I, I think it could spread laterally due to diffusion in the membrane, but also maybe due to kind of hopping, you know, uh, binding and dissociating from there. And I, I don't have any intuition about how fast that spread is going to be or how fast, or I think it'd be a great thing to measure. I think it's a great question. That's wonderful. Um, question from George Aranus. Does uh, Brownian ratcheting also apply to force generation by F actin bundles? Also, this is followed by also more flexible bundles. Do they perform different from the stiffer bundles? Yep. Yeah, that's a great question too. <clears throat> Depends on the context of the bundle. <clears throat> um, some bundles can be uh, coupled to myosin, <clears throat> but that's usually retrograde flow. Um, so, uh, for Philopodia years ago, Tim Mitchison and others showed that the rate of Philopodia protrusion is the kind of um, you know rate of polymerization minus the rate of retrograde flow. So presumably there's some there can be you know bundles that are pushed out by, um, and I can think of a couple of very specialized examples where bundles are pushed out by other forces. But in general, it would be it is the Brownian ratchet. Uh, that uh, mechanism that would be generating force push an actin bundle. Yeah, he added a comment saying that it is the context in the bacterial effectors that cause F actin bundling to promote cell entry. Yep, yep, yeah. So that uh, um, uh, the bundling itself, uh, well, yes, the, the the protrusion. I mean, I think bundling itself might the free energy of bundling would probably generate some force as well. Mm -hmm. Please take a minute. I feel like you're throat. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm, good. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Our next question from Joseph Cirillo uh, is asking about how myosin hey, contractile. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, uh, asking about how myosin contractile forces at the pointed end of the network affect both filament orientation and force generation at the barbed end. Yeah, uh, great question. The um... Uh, again, it depends on context, but there are, uh, for example, on a fish keratocyte, the kind of the myosin generated forces that are kind of back in the lamellum are definitely pulling on the network and pulling the filaments um, uh, while well, playing a role probably in disassembly of the filaments and, and debranching of the network. So the, I think depending on the context, the myosin can actually act as like a trash compactor that's uh, or maybe garbage disposal in your sink, kind of helping to chew up the network and rip it apart. That's cool. Um, next question is from Guillaume Rome. Um, it's puzzling that capping protein and, uh, and actin exhibit similar ratchet mechanism. If, cap uh, if capping protein comes from solution and actin comes from the surface. Well, it sort of doesn't matter where they come from. Uh, and I, I've been thinking about this. Well, there's two answers to this question. One is I don't, I don't think it matters because even if the actin is coming from the surface, that filament has to have the same fluctuation, even if it's coming laterally from the surface or I don't mm -hmm. think the geometry of how it gets there matters in that context. But in, in vivo, I'm not convinced that the capping protein isn't coming from the surface as well. Uh, John Hammer mm -hmm. has these beautiful, uh, this beautiful idea um, based on data. Uh, that capping protein is recruited to uh, sites of branched actin network formation by caramel. Uh, caramel is localized uh, there and capping protein in solution in many cells appears to be inactive bound to a protein called V1. And then uh, when this V1 actin, uh, V1 capping protein complex is bound to caramel, the idea is that they can then be delivered to the barbed end of an actin filament. Uh, it's a great idea and the kinetics seem to work, but I really like that idea that it's the same, that it's literally the same um, idea that there is a surface pool of capping protein. Yeah. Great. Our uh, next question from Leah Kishet. Does the diffusion of monomers from the rear still pose a limitation for replenishing the surface? Um, definitely, the diff yes. But again, there are there are mysteries, I think, here because um, there there are some older results from Graham Dunn and, and I think Claire Waterman reproduced some of these at Woods Hole using photoactivated uh, actin. That uh, that soluble actin near the leading edge moves up to the surface faster than you would expect uh, based on diffusion, and again in a more directed fashion. So suggesting that you know could be bulk fluid flow. 
um, could be membrane flow if this is not a if this is a membrane associated pool of actin. Um, so I think that it's definitely true that um, thermodynamically it has to be that diffusion from solution to that surface is limiting. Yes, uh, uh, thermodynamically it has to be true, but but there's some mysteries about what's going on at the bleeding edge. Thank you. Um, another one is from Alan Alwood. Uh, in your system, have you considered how actin network growth might be stopped to form a control size of actin patch? Uh, yeah, the, there, um, there's, there are ARP2-3 inhibitors. Uh, ARPIN is one. Uh, and I, now when you're talking about actin patches, I assume that mean, it might mean um, yeast. I don't know if there's an ARPIN or anything like that. Yeah, so she, uh, there's a thing about uh, where she says that it fits nicely with some of the work in East West, which is called okay. Last 17. Yep, Last 17. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think in part, you, you might explain that by um, just this explosive positive feedback uh, and limiting com uh, limiting components because yeast doesn't has a much lower concentration of all the components than say a motel cell. Yeah. But, but yeah, so that may be it in yeast, but in, in mammalian cells, for example, there's ARPAN, which seems to limit the extent of uh, <clears throat> branched, the branched action that were spatial extent. Yeah. I think we got all the questions in Zoom. Uh, Jenna, there's some in, um, sorry, just let just stick with the <laughs> Yeah, no, um, I, yeah, I don't think um, that we have any from, from YouTube. Um, I yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I think you probably have some. <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry, I cut you. Do you have a question? Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Okay. So, um, and Dyke, really wonderful talk. And I think this is going to be a great resource also for us to watch it again. I'm definitely going to watch it again to absorb a lot of information about Actin, which I you know, probably was discovered before I was born. So, I mean, uh, certainly, yeah, yeah. So I, I did get an awesome crash it, course on it. Some of it might even have been discovered before I was born, but that was. <laughs> uh, I had a question about protrusion initiation, and this is coming back to you know some of the new literature about how um, it's and not a stratified, but from a uh, Gaudens lab where they're talking about um, Ezrin being there and it needs to be sort of removed to drive this protrusion yeah. initiation. Um, do you really think this, there's some sort of competition which is going on in the membrane where, you know, this competition with Ezrin binding or, you know, these binding factors? I think that's or a, yeah, I think it's a great idea. And it, uh, it would be a satisfying explanation for why, like we were talking about before the talk, um, you can inhibit lamellopod formation and many cells will still bleb and they bleb in the direction of motion, right? They bleb in this and, yeah. and move in this polarized fashion. So I, I, that, that would be a very satisfying explanation for why that happens. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I don't have any, we don't have any data on that. Mm -hmm. Claire, do you have <laughs> some questions? Just say, saying hi. Howdy. Um, I was, I was wondering, so I'm not used to thinking about things and we have one more that popped up in the chat that we'll get to next. I'm not used to thinking about things on sort of the molecular level. I'm thinking at bigger scales and I'm wondering how you think about how this, all this feedback that's happening just at this really small scale at the leading edge, how is that coordinated with the larger things that, you know, the things that are happening across the entire cell, the, the decisions to move the actual ability of the cell to crawl in one direction, you know, how is this um, integrated with everything well, else that's yeah. going on? I think it's, uh, I, like I say, I think of it as a motor and I think there's a discrete number of components that are involved in this uh, motor and, you know, like kinesin or myosin, you know, you, if you kind of understand the way the motor works, uh, and the cell understands how it works, then all you have to do is, you know, put the right signal in the right place and it will just do its thing. Um, and that is gener generate force, have some feed positive, you know, force feedback um, and basically generate whatever shape you tell it to generate. If it's kind of like, I don't know if you're growing up, you ever have these Play-Doh uh, kind of pumper things where you put the Play-Doh in and push the lever and it pushes out. So you could put a, you know, a star on there and push it out and it would form this kind of funny shape. Uh, that's the way the actin network is. Whatever shape you give it, uh, it will kind of push that out 
and you know with an inc you know increasing the dimensionality from whatever you know two to three so if you give it a line it'll make a sheet if you give it a square it'll make a rectangular mm -hmm. solid if you give so it like i say i think it's just a, a functional subsystem of the cell that can be harnessed by the signaling systems to do lots of different things awesome um there's another question if you would like to take it uh from yeah. tommy pallet um, how do you think the network switches confirmation between the two network architectures suggested by Weisel? Sorry, yeah. I might be pronouncing well, the name wrong. Well, their argument was it was kinetic um, and that uh, you, uh, that for example, if you have this kind of architecture, these both of these filaments will stall at high load and, and not be able to generate force. Um, whereas, in this configuration, this filament will not stall. So you can be in a you can be in a force regime where these are both stalled and can't move, whereas mm -hmm. this one can still move. So it's a, there's a basically a kinetic selection for the ones that can move uh, under high load versus the ones that just can't. It's totally stalled. So uh, do uh, they really switch or? It's no, it's selection because there's a lot of ran, You know, there's a lot of noise in the system when you're making filaments. There's but in general that you tend to have on average and low load, this kind of equal mm -hmm. uh, uh, configuration, but you're generating, you know, because of fluctuations, you're generating all these different things. Yeah. And so under low load, you're selecting for these because these can move the fastest. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get high load, suddenly this is the only, this is the only one that can continue to move uh, before you stall everything. Doesn't that also select for um, the most uh, structurally strong because it, you know, there, yep. it's like you can't compress yeah. a filament, but you can sure bend it this way, right? Yep. yep. And that's why the density, yeah, the density keeps going up until, you know, it's interesting because if you grow a network under a certain load and then you increase the load, you'll crush it. Um, so it's just as strong as it needs to be, right? If you grow it under <laughs> super high load, uh, it's totally fine under any load less than that. Um, but any load higher than that will cause plastic deformation. Um, so they're, you know, have... if they have a tough upbringing, they end up being tough. <laughs> All right, we've got more questions coming in. Are you okay to um, stay on? We have three oh, yeah. more that just showed up. Yeah. I got Perfect. Nothing. All right, from <laughs> that's what we like to hear. All right, from Anna, um, she says profilin also helps InnaVasp to polymerize linear actin as well as yeah. the ARP23 complex. So, do you know what is the phenotype of the lamel of the lamel pod? on cells knocked down for profilin or profilin overexpression? That's, those are really good questions. And uh, there's a postdoc in the lab, uh, Kristen Scruber, who did uh, work on that as a graduate student in Eric Vitriol's lab. And you mess with profilin, you really profoundly mess with the ability to make a lamellopodial actin network. Uh, it's not a simple answer, but, but you really do screw up the, um, uh, the ability to make a, a, a branched actin network. Wonderful. Uh, next question, which is very interesting to me, uh, is from Leon de Boer. Um, says, wonderful talk. Uh, interested in, in, you probably already are, are aware of the recent uh, publication from Tobias Mayer's lab showing F actin is distant from the leading edge of the plasma membrane. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? How do you think it squares with the Brownian ratchet? Uh, I don't have any, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I think there's plenty of electron microscopic evidence and other evidence um, supporting the idea that the actin is in close proximity to the membrane. I'll just say Claire that. Is nodding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> I, don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's attached. I think that I don't think it's necessarily attached out there. It may not be attached. Well, I think that there's a weak attachment. Yeah. I don't think there's necessarily strong attachment. Yeah, I don't, it, think, it was, I don't uh, think there's a, I don't think there's a big gap between the ends of the filaments in the membrane. Yeah. It, it, again, coming back to Gauden's thing also, like if there is as and it's attaching, you would think there's some sort of attachment. Yeah. I don't know. It's... Yeah. Sorry, Jen, um, go ahead. I just want to, I want to put in a quick plug. We've got a um, number of mentions of uh, profilin and also that most recent question. So we had a talk a couple of weeks ago by Jessica Henty Radilla, where she presented a lot of work on um, developing uh, uh, 
profilin sensors. So if you guys are interested in that, go back and check that out. It's on the YouTube page. All right, and then I think our last question is from Michael Way. Do you think that different ARP23 isoforms, which have different nucleation efficiencies and stabilities in the network, would show different responses to load? Uh, uh, let me think about that for a second. Um, I don't think so because their response to load, uh, I think, is at the ends of the filaments. It's, it has to do with the capping protein, but it, but it, but they might. I think it's really that's a. I think anything to do with different ARP two three isoforms is really interesting, and I'm waiting for somebody to you know come in and sort that out. I think it's really interesting. It'll be interesting to see what the different subcellular localizations of these are, what different kinds of networks they're associated with, whether they are, whether they um, co-segregate with the different nucleation promoting factors. Um, all of those questions are, are fantastic questions. But, uh, but just as a, 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 my intuition is that probably, probably it doesn't, but, but uh, I'd be happy to be wrong. We are on all those questions right now, Dyke. Uh, it's got, I kind of figured. <laughs> Question. I feel like you leave out cortical flow as an important thing, force that, that ARP23 generates. You know, cortical flow is what powers, you know, the activation of cell surface receptors and things. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like I've, it, you know, there's, there's, times when there's ARP23 mediated actin polymerization that doesn't generate, doesn't deform the membrane outwards, but it, uh, it generates only cortical flow. Yeah. And I think it would just be nice to, to add that to your schema. Sure. Um, yeah, I was trying to be sort of ge more generic. Um, yeah, but I think cortical flow is a generic thing that is important to biology. It is. Not just, I... not just shape change, but cortical flow. Cortical yeah, yeah. flow no, is I, what generates asymmetries. Yeah, I think that's, I agree. Um, I'm not sure that it's, you know, uh, well, anyway, I, I'm not sure that it's relevant to making autophagosomes or to moving intracellular cargo or to the other things, the RP3 it's, complex. It's so. relevant to moving cells relative to each other though. Yeah, right? absolutely, yep, yep. And, and relative to their environment and for clustering receptors to activate receptors and all, you know all kinds of important biology. Yeah, yeah. No, I think all these are fascinating things. There, there are lots of extremely important and interesting things that I don't have anything, any data on. And that's one. <laughs> that's one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just say that it's a general principle that shouldn't be left out. That's yeah, all. Okay. Here. Okay. Anybody who wants a postdoc. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's interested in cortical flow uh, or, or anything else, actually, I'll be shameless uh, to do with uh, self-assembly in eukaryotes or bacteria or even archaea. We have some archaeal projects now too. Uh, give me a call. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. We love if we can make some connections here. <laughs> yeah. shameless, All right. Um, advertising. Should we stop the YouTube thing? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and stop the live stream. So um, just to finish that up, thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you all next week. And thanks Dyke for the fantastic talk and um, lots lots of things to learn. Thank you so thank much Dyke for accepting our invitation. Yep.